YouTube is on. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's <laughs> iBook Bindings live stream. Uh, another one. And um, we, have, we, have a, we have a bit different setup today <laughs> on our screen. Uh, and uh, our guest today is uh, Rianon uh, Sky Tafoya, a printer, bookmaker, artist. Um, and uh, she she joined us from uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, United States. Hi, hi there. How are you? Hi, hi. I'm doing well. So we'll I I I I think uh, we'll talk about a lot of interesting things today. Uh, Pavel, uh, my co-host, as usual, joins us from uh, Serbia. Uh, how from are you, Belgrade, Pavel? yeah. Yeah, from Belgrade. Hi everyone. And great, great. Really excited about today's talk. Yeah, and uh, well, I'm Stepan. I'm uh, uh, currently in, in Windsor in the United Kingdom in England. So uh, that's it so, uh, for, for the uh, introductions. Uh, we also have a second guest uh, uh, today uh, and we'll talk about uh, some, 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 some different stuff, uh, and uh, well, also also related to bookmaking. Uh, it will uh, the second guest will join us in something like about an hour. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, let's let's talk about uh, uh, your art. Could you please uh, well start with a short introduction? I guess your education, how you yeah, came to yeah. be who you are. <laughs> yeah. Um... My name is Rhiannon Sky Tafoya. I go by Sky. Um, I've been in a lot of areas in my life, a lot of movement. I grew up in Cherokee, North Carolina, um, went to boarding school in Oklahoma, moved to New Mexico shortly uh, in my probably around 16 years of age. And I stayed there for about 10 years, moved to Portland for about three and a half. Uh, finally back here, um, I think in 20, 2018 to 2019, moved again, came back here, um, had a baby within that time. And so I think um, right before I had a baby and transitioning into being pregnant and having a kid is when um, the all the art process, like actually kind of selling work and getting invested in becoming a full-time artist really popped off which is a strange thing to say because, I mean, babies usually kind of hinder processes with all the time that's involved in taking care of them. Um, but I think I've been an artist from the majority of my life, maybe not a great artist or like a, I wouldn't say like a successful one, but I've always been into drawing and uh, making things. And I come from uh, families of artists on both of my mom and my dad's side. And so, I, I mean, I've witnessed a lot of art making in my life. And um, when I failed a, a science class in college, I transferred to the Institute of American Indian Arts and started um, my printmaking processes there and then kind of just grew from there and kept kept working at printmaking and then kind of evolved into other ways of making as well. Okay. Nice. Uh, I I wanted yeah. to not not to interrupt you, but but to well to to say uh, to address our uh, viewers. Uh, somebody already started commenting on I see on Facebook. Uh, but uh, uh, if if some of our viewers uh, would like to share from where they are joining us, uh, please tell us. It's always okay. interesting to know from which part of the world uh, people are watching, and sometimes it's uh, it's quite quite interesting and unusual uh, places. Uh, so please, uh, please leave a comment there. Uh, and if, you, of course, if you have any questions uh, to, well, firstly to our guest, but also well, in about book arts and bookbinding in general, also please uh, leave a comment and we'll try to answer it or maybe keep for the uh, future. So, uh, and yeah, also please links, uh, check the links in the description uh, because uh, there are some links to uh, Sky's uh, Instagram and, uh, and website and well, lots of other useful links like Patreon, which will help helps us uh, to uh, do these live streams and uh, uh, some research work for, for them. And uh, uh, Richard Minsky uh, has uh, joined us from Stock Stockport, New York, and uh, Barbara Lemke. Yeah, Barbara Lemke Aurora. Uh, hello, listening from the South Carolina uh, State Museum in Columbia, South Carolina, USA. 
Um, and uh, there are some more viewers there, there as well. So uh, please uh, uh, tell us from where you join us and uh, uh, maybe ask some questions. Uh, Pavel? Uh, I, I, I think it's time for us to listen what Sky has to, sh uh, uh, to, sh uh, to show and tell about her, uh, her art. Sky, please do. Yeah, okay. Um, I know that I said that I wasn't, I was kind of hoping not for interruptions, but I think I'd rather kind of like answer questions as we go along if, if there's something that pops up and what's, what's um, oh, maybe yeah. I need to what, clarify. Uh, the, uh, the, there is one question. You mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the... Uh, uh, the Institute of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of American Indian Arts. Could yeah. you uh, could you tell us a bit about the institution and about the program that uh, that you had there? Uh, wh where is it? What what is it? Uh, and what did you do there? Yeah, it's a art school for Native people in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's been housed at a few different locations within Santa Fe. Um, I went, I think I started going there in 2010. Um, they have a lot of different uh, varieties of media. I think they have performing arts, which is one of the newer things. Um, I went there for printmaking and sculpture. They have a, a beautiful foundry. Um, their printmaking is really great. I think they do a lot of water-based type printmaking there. Um, I recently had a, um, a residency there too back in September and it was really nice to revisit the campus and get familiar with like new spots that that have grown there and um, I, it's just really beautiful to be there because I mean uh, coming from like native backgrounds a lot of native students um, love to be around other native people and I think especially being so young when you first enter undergrad um, it's really important to establish community especially within art spaces because they can be really harsh at times. Um, what I what I had found in graduate school is that it was a lot harder to succeed while not having like a native community surrounding me. Whereas like when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts, I felt very comfortable um, presenting all the work that I had and learning how to like grow and learn from other native artists and also about their cultures. And also the place itself, it's uh, in uh, it's in Pueblo revival style. When I first saw it, I th I thought to myself, "Oh my God, how old is it? It look uh, 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 all the images of it look uh, like a uh, hundreds years old Pueblo building, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's 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 oh, a like really Adobe style. Place. Yes, it's yeah. not Adobe style. Yeah, a lot of the buildings are uh, Adobe style. Um, I. I... If I'm not mistaken, I think that I I started in the '60s. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm correct in that. I I mean I can't don't quote me on it, but it's a very successful school. There's been so many great artists come out of it, and to, also to um, to say more about it is that there's a lot of like there's a lot of Native scholars that come out of there too. So it's not just an art school. They have an Indigenous. Um, studies program, which is like really based in a lot of critical thinking of like Indian politics and like law. And uh, like what, one of my friends, Ali Moran, she went to school there for that program. It's called Indigenous Liberal Studies. And she she never really even went into like an arts um, coursework program, but she came out like, like so, so, so intelligent about, I, I used to just like, be so, so much in awe of her of how she would study and study and study and it was so different from like the arts programs where you know we would make and make and make but she was like in the library all the time while we were like in the studios all the time so it's a it's a really cool place because it also provides like um intellectuals and scholars on top of artists as well and could you perhaps talk a bit about uh uh, the place that printing uh, takes in uh, 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 contemporary indigenous culture, because uh, when you talk about sculpture, uh, immediately so many examples uh, come to mind, but not so much about printing, or maybe it's just me, I've, I've never heard about indigenous printers. Well, I think the history of indigenous like printmaking is a little, um, can be a little 
traumatizing just because when the printing press was uh, brought to Native communities, it was mostly to um, force Christianity on them, you know, like, th so then they were mass printing all of these, like, Bibles in in Native languages to to help that assimilation. And so it's kind of like a it's not a pretty past in my, in my perspective. Um, I think that it's, it's really sad actually. Um, but that's kind of like, even with the Cherokee syllabary, um, that whole like syllabary has about 80, I think there's 85 characters. I think there were 86 at one point, but when I was, um, like doing more deeper research on the Cherokee syllabary, um, there is a metal type, so you can use it in printmaking. And it was made, first foundered in the 1820s. But when it goes through the foundering process, especially at that time, um, the characters were switched and changed. So like, even that has like a sad past to it where it it's not in its original, original form anymore. Like when Sequoia, the creator of it, when he made it, his style of it was so different. But in order to like, put it through a printing press and founder the founder it all, all the 85 characters, it had to be switched around and format it to fit these, these other types of like characters that already existed in foundry. And so the mats had to be like made similarly to other mats as well. They couldn't do the whole like flowy um, script that it originally was. And uh, we, we should probably explain for our non-US uh, non viewers that Sequoia, he was a Cherokee. He was, uh, yeah. So, so it, it is a very rare, rare example of uh, writing of Native peoples developed from inside, not, impo yeah, absolutely. not imposed from, by, by outsiders. And, and, and you use it in your work, uh, am I correct? I do use it. Um, I don't use it as much. Uh, I did use it in my um, my artist book, Olnigid. Um, and I've used it in a few other projects, but I'm really careful in when I use it because I'm not a fluent speaker and, and nor do I ever want to pretend that I am. So I feel like I don't like, I obviously like have a connection to it, but I don't want to exploit it in a manner that, um, just doesn't feel like comfortable or accurate to me. So I don't use it as much. I do have a, um, a I think a 24 point set of it, which I got through a residency um, at one point in my life. But yeah, I'm, I'm more into um, like uh, ornamental type now. Uh, but other people uh, do use it. Are there they do. papers, websites? How is it used? How alive is uh, is it? Um, I mean, it's on keyboards for, um, iPhones. Uh, there's a press, Swamp Press up in, um, uh, can't, somewhere in the Northeast of the United States, uh, Swamp Press, they founder it there, but even that, like, it gets a little tricky in my opinion, because I think that that language should distinctively be within our own communities and, Unfortunately, we don't have people who founder type, so we can't do it. But I just don't see why another place should have it and should be making money off of it when none of those profits go to the Cherokee people at all. So that's a discussion later to have with like the Swamp Press and the foundry there. But, you know, it's it, it gets a little tricky. It gets, you know, people think that they own things that they don't really own. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting question and issue. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess we'll ask you to uh, to 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 proceed with your uh, presentation, and we'll try not to okay. interrupt you. But probably, if, you, <laughs> if 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 at some at some spare places you will feel that uh, you are ready to uh, answer some questions, uh, please tell us, and we'll see if if any questions are. Uh, are there in in the comments uh, uh, below the videos on on Facebook and YouTube? And uh, uh, to our viewers, please, if you have any question, post them. And uh, when when Sky is comfortable uh, to answer them, 
will do it. So it's it, it would be better if there are any if there are some questions before that moment. So <laughs> do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll start with this image. Um, this image is in our um, or this uh, basket is in our collection of the Museum of Cherokee Indian in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, this is actually my maternal grandmother's uh, basket, and so I always have to go back to like. Uh, the basketry within my family because that's kind of where my art always goes and where my art is always influenced from and inspired from and so I actually just met this basket um, within the last month and so it was nice to uh, hold it and it was just like it, it really did just call to me I was there and I was like oh this one and I pulled it out and it was my grandma so it was really nice to hold because our family unfortunately doesn't have very many of hers They've, kind of, they've just been sold within her lifetime and um, they're really hard to get back or to find to um, try to get back. And uh, this was something I worked on at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And so my dad is also a basket weaver, um, although he uses red willow to weave baskets. And so when I did live in Santa Clara Pueblo with him, uh, we would make baskets during the winter time and he taught that to me. And so when I was in undergrad at the Institute of American Indian Arts, I, I was um, in the foundry a lot. And so I was doing like a lot of metal sculpture and I was welding a lot and making wood sculptures and doing these things. And so I thought it would be really cool to make a really huge metal basket. And so I started this, um, I welded it together and then I uh, found all of this wire just kind of lying around. And then I went to buy some extra wire. And me and my dad um, kind of made this basket together and it measures about uh, four and a half feet in diameter. So it's a pretty large basket. Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah. large basket. And if you, if you check out the color, um, it'll change significantly in the next slide. Because so when I did for, for, re revisit... For our, sorry, um, for, for our non-American uh, viewers, four and a half feet is something like a meter and a half. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so... In the next photo that I'll show you, I it was returned to me. So I made this, I think, in 2012, maybe, 2011, 2012. And when I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in uh, September for the residency, I was there for a month and ran into some old sculpture people. And um, one of the guys were like, hey, your sculpture's still in the foundry. And he's like, do you want me to bring it to you? And he's an instructor there, so he had his students um, bring it to me and this is what it looks like now. Um, it's really weathered, which is really unique though, because now it kind of matches um, the red willow a little bit more with the, the deep rusty browns. Actually, I like so, it this way. Yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I was able to put this in uh, one of my solo shows at the university, uh, I'm sorry, Linfield University in, um, McMinnville, Oregon. And then going back to, um, I guess like my previous, cause that's a really old work. Um, this work is uh, from I think 2016 or 2017. And this was my first attempt at weaving paper and mixing uh, screen printing and letterpress printing. And so the main image is a screen print and the letterpress is what's woven inside of that. And, and then again, is this it, is uh, just like I'm so I'm sorry. And what is it printed on? I uh... this past one. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. What's uh, mm -hmm. it's printed on black paper. It's a um, gold and maroon on black paper with the screen print, and then the strips that are here, these lighter strips, are letterpress printed with um, ornaments. Okay. And then again, this is a letterpress print on the back side, and then a screen print um, adhered on top of the letterpress print. And so I didn't do a lot of paper weaving when I was um, at graduate school. So this is from my graduate school uh, in Portland, Oregon. It was called the Pacific Northwest College of Art. I didn't do a lot of this work. This is just a small detail. Um, basically, I wasn't really ready to dive into I guess like the basket or talk about my heritage like I think I mentioned earlier at the Institute of American Indian Arts it was really really easy to 
to have that community and to have those stories shared, but within like another audience that doesn't understand um, native cultures, it's really, really hard because it, it a lot of times doesn't focus on the work and instead focuses on how much cultural information can I get out of you? And so that was, that was really hard for me in grad school because a lot of times it wasn't about my work. It was like, well, is this about like dancing? Is this about, I don't know, your ceremonies? Is it about, you know, and it was just a little too much for me. Like it was, it, it was too invasive. And so I st- I didn't really make a lot of this type of work. I focused on book arts and I focused on very abstract design work. But then again, this is this was from one project that I did while I was there, and um, I really enjoyed making it. It was just it was just really hard to present it and be fully, um, I guess, fully open to critiques because critiques are so like harsh in grad school. Like they're not very kind, and they're not they're invasive. They're not respectful and. I don't think that they're very respectful, but it led me into this work. And so um, I learned bookbinding when I was in um, graduate school. And so what I really wanted to do was make these pop-up structures. And I was like, I really want to make a really large pop-up book, one where that I can like immerse myself into. And so I made this out of um, honeycomb cardboard um, some screen prints, uh, black Tyvek, and just um, some regular two-ply cardboard. But the tallest structure is nine feet tall, and then the base is uh, 16 foot by 16 foot. And I don't know the conversions into... Um, yeah, so nine feet tall is... I don't know if you three, could do that. Three meters, yeah. And uh, what, what, what are the other dimensions? Um, the tallest structure that's right here yeah. is nine feet tall. Yeah, so it's three meters. These are around yeah. four feet. Yeah, okay. Four, mm-hmm. four feet is a meter and a third, something like that, yeah. And and 15 feet, uh, and you said, uh, what was uh, the horizontal uh, dimension, 15 feet? Uh, the base of it is um, 16 foot by 16 foot. Yeah. So, so five it's... meters and a half. Five yeah. meters and a bit, yeah. yeah. Five meters and a half. Uh, yeah. So it's like, like a room, really, in, in, in yeah. square footage. <laughs> and what's really neat is that, like, with honeycomb cardboard, um, you have the ability to walk on it without damaging it too much. <clears throat> it's pretty strong. And so this was constructed with um, sheets, sheets of honeycomb cardboard for the base, and then just wrapped with um, the Tyvek and printed on directly on the Tyvek. And then if you look in this lower part, these are um, gold, fo- gold foil screen prints that I did um, prior to uh, making it, and then I just adhered it onto the base. But here is um, a video of the opening yeah. of it. So definitely needed four people to open it. And it was a very delicate structure. Um, at the time I was um, making this, someone referred me to Colette Fu, who was also making a large pop-up book at, in Philadelphia. And so I looked at, she had just made it, I think like a few months prior. And so I, I emailed her and asked her, asked her about um, the process of everything. And she was just like, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's really hard. And she used really, really nice material. I think it's called gator board and it's just, it's a very expensive material. And I, di- I didn't have, the money to do that. Actually, my um, uh, honeycomb cardboard was a donation. Some some arts organization within Portland had a bunch of sheets that they used for something, and then um, they had nothing to do with them. So they're like, "Who needs them?" And someone emailed me, and we're like, "Like, do you need these cardboard?" And so my friend Molly and I went to go pick uh, pick them up and just brought them back to the studio. Nice. Uh, uh, and that's that, that's by the way something we discussed. Well, uh, I, that reminds me of two things. Because firstly, we we talked to uh, British bookbinder uh, Mark Cockrum, who uh, uh, told us about his experience of making really huge book for I think for BBC or something like that. So it was uh, oh. uh, higher than than a person, but it was in 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 many other ways. It was 
uh, like uh, like an ordin or ordinary codex form book. So in the end, it was really heavy, and uh, well, they were quite surprised uh, the the, uh, the people people who ordered it uh, by by the weight and uh, and uh, uh, the complications <laughs> that are coming with it. But the other thing is uh, yeah. Uh, with uh, in in one of our first podcasts, we talked to a uh, uh, French bookbinder who is currently residing in the Netherlands, Ben Elbel, and he with him we talked about uh, uh, use of materials uh, for the young and starting bookbinders, and it's like uh, you you can use almost everything you 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 can find. And, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, oftentimes you can you can work with uh, donated materials, like you said. Uh, sometimes you, if you, if you work in in an area where there are some printing uh, uh, companies or something like that, you can even ask if they can uh, give you some offcuts or something like that. So uh, uh, it not always you have to spend money on materials, and it, it's important to, yeah. to be able to ask other people for 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 materials because well, oftentimes you can get something for free. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, also with Mark, we discussed uh, uh, another giant pop-up book. Uh, it's pretty famous in uh, uh, in Britain. It used to be exhibited in uh, in the V&A uh, Museum. It's now it's uh, in Dundee. It's uh, about uh, as big as yours. It was made by uh, John Bird, Sc uh, Sc uh, Scottish artist, and he made it uh, made it for a, a, a touring theatre exhibition. And it spent like a couple of years on the road, and it's wow. all beaten, uh, it's all beaten up. It shows, <laughs> and uh, where, uh, and uh, now now it's in Dundee in uh, in uh, VNA the Dundee Museum. And once a month they turn a page, and uh, it's something like twenty people spending two hours very very <laughs> neatly, <laughs> even though. <laughs> It used to be a uh, hold on on top of the roof a roof of a bus, but nowadays it's an artifact. Uh, I'll yeah. I, I'll send I'll send you the link. It's a, it's, okay, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a very imp impressive book, and so is yours. And what I want I wanted Thank to you. ask you is it meant? Uh, you said that you could walk on it, but how is it meant to be watched when in a gallery? Well. I intended for people to walk on it, but the more I wrote about it and it kind of was a transition or a, it was like a self-reflection of my time in graduate school of like feeling very um, closed off and not aware of these like, I don't know, living in a city is so different from like places that I lived before. And so a lot of these structures are like city type structures, but uh, on the next slide, um, this is where I put the baskets and so this is like th this whole project was called the book the body the basket and so they this was specifically just for me this was like no one else really could see this these baskets printed they're within the nine foot structure so you can't look inside of it um, but you know it was about taking up space but allowing myself to close close like during the nighttime and it really did just live for like two and a half weeks, I think. Um, and I had to assemble it in space as well because none of the, I couldn't pre-assemble anything because I couldn't get it through elevators or through doorways and stuff. So I had to assemble everything within that space. And then I took down everything in that space and it was, it was kind of sad like to, to deconstruct everything after spending so much time making it. But it was also like um, kind of just erasing and moving on to like the next part of um, at that time, I didn't realize I would have an art career, but, you know, I thankfully do. And I'm happy that this was kind of like my starting off point of like, well, I did something really extravagant and I have to keep doing things that are extravagant. And so I, I always try to push myself to do like really, really tough, um, tough projects. I mean, I've been told a lot that like, is this, are you really able to do these projects? And, you know, eventually they get done. But this was one of those types of projects where it was just, it, it strained me a whole lot. <laughs> So uh, we we have a couple of questions uh, on uh, on Facebook and YouTube. So uh, when you feel it's it's okay, okay to answer some of them, just just tell me. 
Um, I will because I think I'm going to start talking about Ulmigid next. So yeah. it's a whole different project from this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So between them. Yeah. Or or you mean right now? Oh, right now. Yeah. Because oh, okay. then I can. <laughs> okay. Okay. Perfect. Because it's probably about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This stuff and uh, also basket weaving and, uh, uh, yeah. and, and, and stuff that we discussed before. So maybe it's, it's, it's reasonable to, to, to deal with it now and uh, move, move on from, from there. So, and also a couple of comments people uh, from people saying from where they are uh, joining us. And uh, uh, Amanda J. R. Selman, uh, Stockport, Manchester, United Kingdom. Um, and then uh, Minkas, uh, I'm from the, from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, Tanuki Mischief joining from so called Asheville, uh, North Carolina. Love your work, Sky. And uh, so, a couple of questions. Um, so, founding type is, a su is subject to commercial and cultural appropriation. That's that's a question, I guess, to to our earlier discussion. Yeah. Um, I don't think a lot of people. I think it's an unpopular opinion. Um, but yes, I think it is uh, an appropriation, and uh, I. It's unpopular, and I. Probably need to have a meeting with that person before, like, discussing or like getting so upset about it. Um. So that I can kind of explain or like maybe we, my hope is that that foundry owner would, I don't know, come teach some Cherokee people on how to do that and give that stuff back to our community. Because, you know, whenever the Trail of Tears happened, that whole press was just knocked out. Like no one even knows where it's at. And a lot of that type um, isn't a museum in Georgia, but only pieces of it because uh, they just destroyed everything. And so it, it's kind of, it's kind of hurtful to have a foundry, like making money off of a language that they don't know and don't realize that there's a lot of people here in Cherokee and in Oklahoma and Cherokee nation and Gadua band that are speakers. We don't have a lot of speakers anymore. And so, um, I think those things really need to be considered when we're thinking about language initiatives and we really just need to give back to our own communities and allow us to do everything with our language because it's not meant for other people, it's our language. And also also from, from Amanda, another question uh, with enforced moving of, or, or comment, I guess, so, uh, or both, uh, with enforced moving of uh, in indigenous people, it kind of undermines place as a designation of authenticity. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, there is a question mark there, but uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> how to formulate it then. I'm thinking of how Maybe products she can, can, uh... can, can be tied to a place and its heritage. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess it's, well, it, it's obviously about uh, the, the uh, forced uh, uh, removal of people and, uh, and uh, uh, moving of, of cultural objects and uh, not uh, uh, this, this culture, uh, cultures not, to be, not being tied to the places from the, the, where they are originated. But maybe, maybe Amanda will be able to add something else. Uh, and then there, there is wow yeah. from Amanda, and that that, that was uh, about about the pop-up book. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I I wanted to elaborate on uh, uh, this last uh, question. So you mentioned that you are from uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, but Cherokee Nation isn't uh, is no longer just in North uh, Carolina. Uh, am I right? Yeah, uh, they're not because of the forced removal. Um, everyone was forced to go to um, at that time called Indian territory. And so there's a Cherokee nation tribe there, which um, all the people were moved West. And they also have another band there called the United Gadua band, which um, just has a, is, is the same peoples. It's just that they have like a more strict, um, membership kind of um process um they i think they have more speakers and stuff they're more culturally um involved than maybe a lot of the Cherokee nation might be because they Cherokee nation has a whole whole lot of members 
Uh, and are, are the, uh, the western and the eastern part of, uh, uh, of the nation uh, uh, other uh, other connections like uh, like say common f uh, common fest uh, festivals uh, or uh... um we share uh, we share things together yeah um uh, Cherokee Nation has a remember the removal bicycle ride and so they invite eastern band to be a part of that um I hope in the future they'll start inviting uh, the United Kadua Band as well, because I think they're deserving to be a part of that. Um, so if any Cherokee Nation people are listening, maybe, you know, put that out there. Um, there's also, I mean, a lot of Cherokee Nation, Nation people will come here and kind of reconnect with like their homelands, you know, and they're always welcome and, um, like I know I have a few friends out in Cherokee Nation also because I went I went to school within the Cherokee Nation um, uh, territory uh, when I went to boarding school. So yeah, we we uh, I mean, we share the same language. It's just a little different because of uh, dialects. So I'll, I'll read a couple of more uh, questions and comments and uh, then, then, then we'll continue with with uh, um your books if that's okay so uh dave turnbull mm -hmm. uh lovely uh, again about the i guess it was about the metal basket uh lovely looking basket do you make baskets from pine needles kai oh no um so my dad he makes baskets out of red willow and so i used to make baskets out of red red, uh, red willow with him and right now I don't make baskets a lot. I just really learned how to make um, Cherokee baskets last year. And so I use um, white oak for the most part. I don't, I don't, I've never used pine needle. I think that might be um, more um, Arizona, California region that uses pine, pine needle. Okay. And then uh, from from Dave again. Hi from Scotland, by the way. So <laughs> they, they, Dave joined, joined us from Scotland. And uh, also, uh, what else? We have some 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 more comments. Uh, also from Amanda. Um, it makes me think how skyscrapers just uh, bury what came uh, before the little baskets become so poignant. Uh, and that's that's about the pop-up book again. Uh, we're returning to the pop-up book. Um, Richard Minsky, uh, there was a great two-day symposium last week, a new direction in indigenous uh, book history. Sky's presentation would have fit in well in, in the book art section. If she's not in, in contact with these uh, people, it might be of interest uh, um, to her. And uh, he he uh, posted the link, so uh, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll send yeah. it to you a bit later if, if you need it. Um, Barbara Lemke Rohrer, uh, there is a growing movement of uh, repatriating indigenous uh, objects and artifacts to the cultures and or descendants of the artists, artisans, uh, and uh, and uh, trace people who originally developed them. Well, just just a comment. Uh, the, yeah, there is a movement, but it's not widespread enough. It it sort of just started, really. You mean like giving back? Yeah. Um, yeah. Things that were made before. Yeah. 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 It's a very slow process too. Yeah. yeah. It's very slow. And I don't know how often they return back to families other than like the tribal nation itself. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned there is a Cherokee uh, museum. So there is mm -hmm. a place where it couldn't be, it could be not just returned, but also access uh, accessible. Oh yeah, yeah. Our museum is great in um, offering um, collections tours whenever, whenever we want. You know, like anytime I want to go visit that basket, like I can, or visit other things within our collections there. Like, as an Eastern Bend member, as well as all the other Eastern Bend members, they're welcome to do that. All they have to do is just contact uh, are the museum. Other collections of contemporary artists. Uh... They're starting to do more uh, contemporary art now. Um, they have a new uh, director as of uh, probably like the last two years, and she's she's really focused on um, collecting more contemporary Native art as well. 
so there are two more comments. I'll read them and we'll we'll move, move okay. on. Uh, but uh, if if anyone will have any any other questions, please post them and we'll try to answer answer them a bit later, uh, if if there is still time for that. So. Um, uh, so uh, also from um, Amanda J. Al Alselman, in, in Europe countries like uh, uh, France, uh, uh, in, 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 in European countries like France, food and wine can be uh, protected and only made in that place. Uh, yeah, region protected in Italy as well. Uh, and uh, as that can be applied to uh, by, by territory, do, in, do the indig indigenous people have legal battles to own their uh, cultural artifacts. That sort of follows the, the previous uh, comment about returning the artifacts but we are back to mm -hmm. uh, to their creators, which is yeah, a long and slow process. But yeah, I think I think okay. I, at least at least I've heard about some legal battles to return artifacts. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm not the person to comment about it. <laughs> uh, and it, there it is can also... get real frustrating to talk about. Yeah, yeah, and, and and there is also a great question on on YouTube from Santi Frezia. Uh, could you discuss the differences in making art within a cultural context as opposed to an institutional context? I'm mostly referring to process and aims of the work. So within institution versus within community, is that what yes. Santi means? Yes, I, I think that's, uh, uh, that's what they mean, yes. Um, in my personal experience, when I made work in institution, especially PNCA, I was often tokenized. I was also really scared to be authentic because I didn't want to be to tokenized. So when I'm in my own community, I don't feel that way. Like I'm able to just be my most authentic self and do the work that I want to do and pull from traditional arts, but also stay within my contemporary um, ways of making with like paper and printmaking. And I get I, that would be the big difference for me. Um, I didn't have a very good um I mean, I wouldn't say my grad experience was horrible, but there were a lot of moments where I felt um, alone and I didn't feel like I had a community to express all my frustrations to or um, even talk about cultural, cultural significance in art making. Like, I didn't have that when I was at PNCA. But I think, like, now that I'm home, like, I do have, like, more of that... Um, uh, community like my partner is a really great person to talk to uh, like we could just go on and on about all of these things and it it feels good to finally like be able to just take take my own experiences and put them down on paper without feeling too judged or um, just placed like in a pamphlet or something <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, 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 is a, it is a big problem that you are supposed in the modern art world to market your, your own experiences. You are supposed to bear your soul and to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to give everything uh, you have. Uh, you, you are a, commo a commodity, your emotions, your background. It's, it's all supposed yeah. to be sold, marketed, basically. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna move on into yeah, the yeah, next yeah, right. stuff because I have if, a lot if, of slides. If if any if anybody has has more questions, just post them and we'll try to answer them and uh, uh, later. Okay, um, so after I uh, graduated from grad school, I didn't really have um, a path. I didn't have like a plan or like anything that I wanted to do. All I had was like. Um, a few people saying I should apply for a certain grant residency. So I did, and I applied to the Women's Studio Workshop in Rosendale, New York. They have a book arts um, residency grant where they'll publish your book for you and help you like, you know, just bring it to fruition. And so I made a prototype for it. That was part of the application process. So I'm home. I moved back to Cherokee after I graduated. Um, I lived with my brother for quite a while and he really took care of me but this is when I kind of really 
got more focused on basketry again because like I just feel like every single time I'm start starting to make like I just ref I revert back to it. It's just some it's just a calling that I have and I I just so in love with basketry. But this is an image of um, part of my uh, prototype process and so my early weavings I've gotten a lot better at um, putting them together since then. This is one of the um, early designs that I had for Olingid. Uh, another way that I was weaving was that I was cutting everything down and just kind of taping a border and then weaving like that. Um, now I create within um, a piece of paper. So I have one whole sheet of paper and then I have the weavers that can go through it. And so everything is intact rather than this um, looseness that I have going on in this picture. But these are some photos from the prototype. Um, the top is just some chipboard, just figuring out the ways in which it can move back and forth. And the whole goal was just, you know, to make a book that could be a basket as well. And that's kind of what I got from that huge pop-up book is that like, that was called the book, The Body, The Basket. And so I'm just continuing to prototype, putting things together, um, creating a structure I had never seen before in book binding. Um, I had a vision and I just went for it. I had very little like material or money. <laughs> Like I had like just very little book cloth to put everything together, but this is what it turned out to be. And so this is the prototype, sent it in mm -hmm. and I received the book arts grant and it was one of my first really big like steps into, uh, I guess like the art world or like the book art world. And this is at um, WSW. On the left is Chris Patron, who is incredible, incredible, incredible bookbinder. She can turn anything into a book in like five seconds. She's just so wonderful. And then, um, sorry, Erin Zona on the right-hand side, who is the artistic director there. Um, she handles like a lot of, um, uh, I guess, just like we, we would have meetings with her and she would go through like the writing and um, the next step and think about like the concepts by every behind everything why everything looks the way it does or does it need to be made in this material or you know all of the like real conceptual back backings of of the book this is um this is how I used to uh, do a lot of my sketches is just on graph paper and then I'd I Xerox copied everything and then gave them to other people so they could do, help me do all the weavings Thankfully, um, they had a few interns there at the time, and their whole um, their whole grant is kind of geared to like getting the interns invested in these projects too, so they have experience in making uh, making and publishing books. And so the interns would sit with me, and we just weave paper um, every every night. I would cut down all the paper stuff, and then the next morning we would just go to work on all the weavings. And so this is for the side panels of that weaving. That that was that was my question because it definitely looks like a lot of work with this this uh, book, oh. this object. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um the goal was 50 to 100 yeah. for the edition, but we only made it to 44. It it's just very tedious work. Um so these are Actually, on the left side is uh, one of the early, early examples. If you could tell, there's two different colors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is when we were prototyping, like what what type of colors to use within the book, and so we, of course, went with the one on the right side. Uh, the left side I thought was just a little too bright, and I was mm -hmm. trying to mimic like natural dye colors that we use in basketry here in Cherokee. So that's kind of like um, just like beginning and going in onto the other images, stacks and stacks of these weavings. And, you know, we had uh, four side panels and then a center weaving for each book. So five weavings within the book. Um, for the center panels though, or the um, base panels, I wove all of those. Um, I only had help with the uh, side ones. 
I think that the uh, bottom panels were just a little too much to weave. Mm -hmm. These were more, um, uh, I guess, controllable for everyone else to get involved. And it wasn't just the interns. Like there are a lot of people in the Rosendale community who um, came in as just like friends and artists that would help sit there and help weave. Even if it was just one, they came in and and all of their names are in the colophon. I credit everyone who came in and um, gave their time to this project because it really did take a, like hours and hours. So this is the base uh, design for that weaving. and the fast time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think these took me an hour and 45 minutes to weave each one, not counting cutting all of this stuff down. Like that gets tiring. We tried to make a jig um, out of these, uh, God, this, I guess they're like uh, die cuts, like die cutting things that you can put on the press and then it hits together and it can cut things, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we tried to have one made where everything was like an eighth of an inch. It had all these blades and we tried using it to cut all the paper, but it just, it didn't work. So we had, I had to go back to cutting everything by hand and they're all um, one eighth of an inch. Yeah. So it's three millimeters or something like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, so that that was that was your current process. You told us that initially you cut all the all the stripes separately, and then you had to sort of uh, uh, rig them together with with a tape or something like that. But later you switched to 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 a different process when uh, the the, the oh. sheet is not fully cut, but it has has these. Uh, um, this is yeah. what I. This is kind of how I do it now. Yeah, I yeah, make the whole yeah. sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then. The letterpress pr printing involved in the book, everything's letterpress printed um, with metal type and the cover is photopolymer that we had made. And one piece, the image on um, the pamphlet fold out has a photopolymer image. But other than that, everything is like hand set. And so this is me um, printing the cover. And it was a lot of work and a lot of like staying consistent with everything. And also the paper for everything um, was handmade by Chris Patron. And so even finding consistencies in the papers because the paper had to be a certain thickness for it to be able to be bound around the book, book board. So there was like ones that were super, super thick and ones that were too thin. And so we had to go sort through all of that and, find which ones that we actually needed to print on and make into the book. And so you can see the photopolymer down here mm -hmm. and the illustration, how we got there. So all this image and this image, it's all photopolymer, but this paper of course had to be run through um, three different times. All right. No, just twice. Um, one for this and then over here. And then also like trying to make sure everything is aligned perfectly so that um, we can then we cut out a piece right here for the um, the back cover for the weaving. And then having to like fold this part around the front cover and this part around the other side of the front cover. Chris Patron did a lot of the math like she's just she's so incredible and then so with this um these were all handset and printed um this part right here is the photopolymer um that one of the interns um created the digital file for we sent it out to boxcar press and they brought they uh, sent it back and was able to print that and so here you can see the syllabary and yeah, these are all just um, uh, writings to my kid because when I got there, I found out it was a, I was pregnant. Like the first, I think I was like five days in, and so that made this project even more extreme because I had to spend so much time within the project, but I was also exhausted because in your first trimester, you're always really exhausted. 
Um, so it it was really it was really challenging, but I was thankful enough that the, I had a lot of support, like especially with the weavings and with the paper making. Um, I had I focused on the letterpress printing and weaving and assembling all the books together. But Chris Patron also did a lot of um, the actual book binding of Olmigid. But she would set up a lot of jigs for me. So we figured out all these ways and like how to, we had to cut, like here are all like the hinges and that's probably the hinge. You know, these are stacks of things that we have to weigh down. Um, these right here are all the um, panels that were cut out. Uh, we also have magnets in the book. So within um, these little sections right here on these panels, we had to cut out little sections to put the magnet in and then put something on top of that so that when the book closes, it just magnetizes back to the um, to the close. It, I mean, it's all pretty fascinating. Like it's it's crazy, like how much we actually got accomplished. And so here is um, another jig for the pamphlet, just cutting down all the pamphlets and then also adhering the pamphlets because um, the press isn't long enough to to do all of the printing on one one go. So I had to print like three of them and then print two more on another paper and then adhere them together to make the pamphlet. And then it constructed into this. So there's one, two, and three, and then this, no, I'm sorry, one, two, three, and then this part is adhered to this paper. Mm -hmm. The colors are absolutely amazing. In in the end, uh, you you mentioned that you 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 had to do some choosing of of colors, and uh, you switched uh, to to uh, the dollar shade, and uh, the overall yeah balance of color is absolutely amazing. Yeah, and then the yellow um, the yellow ochre for the for the paper. You know, I hadn't made paper at that point. Um, and what I found out last year when I was making paper is that yellows are extremely hard to make. And so mm -hmm. I was like sending Chris back and forth like, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. And like when I found out like how hard yellow is to make, I felt so bad. Like she she worked her ass off. She's she's just so incredible. Can't say anything bad about her. She's just like such a hard worker and she has the best dog and she she's really good company. But um, we did use uh, hinges, so we used some book cloth for the hinges. So it's not all paper. Like we had to do that so that the paper wouldn't deteriorate over time. And then it's like a close up of um, trying to match this image right onto the weaving. Yeah, and we did pretty well. Did my best to get it right on there. <laughs> The whole process was pretty meticulous. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to have questions about Olnigid because I'm going to start kind of moving on into my my process of paper weavings now. Uh, yeah, there were, there were just a couple of comments. And uh, Barbara Lemkarora, uh, your weaving process is fascinating to watch. And yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And then Dave Turnbull, uh, the book, uh, book looks stunning. Uh, the amount of time and effort just uh, to just cut everything must have been phenomenal. Well, again, <laughs> I can only agree with that. Uh, so yeah, please proceed. And uh, again, if anyone has okay. any questions, uh, please please post them. We'll try to answer them. We we plan to stay with Sky for an hour, and uh, it's it's already an hour. So uh, we are going to overtime. But yeah. anyway, uh, you can still post the questions. We can pass the uh, pass them to Sky uh, later and uh, maybe uh, make a follow-up or something like that. And also, if if any of our new newer watchers uh, are willing to share from where they are joining us, it's always fun to to see from where people are watching our live stream. Please, please leave a comment. Uh, so, yeah, Sky, please. Okay. Um, and so, uh, after we finished Only Get, I think we finished it in the winter of 2020. Um, I was still pregnant and so I had Otis in June of 2020 and this is Otis 
a, a lot of my time while I was pregnant and also like right, her, right after giving birth is that I didn't do a lot of work during that time. I made a few different things like for people's gifts and things like that, but I was really focused on just rest and taking care of Otis. And as Otis was a newborn, I was a little like um, frustrated that I couldn't go work because, you know, take, having a baby does take so much time out of your day. And he was really close to me and I was breastfeeding as well. So um, I taught myself how to make my designs in Adobe Illustrator so that I could start at least doing some type of work while I was holding him, like however many hours of the day, it seemed so long. Um, my partner does a lot of um, digital digital work. So I, I would see him holding the baby and he'd be able to work and do his thing. And it's like, oh, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I previously, I've tried to learn digital tools and like it just always, I can't understand it. I can't wrap my hand, head around it. So I stayed focused and I like, you know, looked up different blogs and how to and stuff like that. And so I figured out how to actually do it. And so then I started like turning in my, turning my designs into digital designs so that I could have them to print off if I needed them or as templates too. Cause I always like work on a piece of paper or work digitally and then I'll print them. And then that's how I construct all my paper weavings by creating this template and just seeing how to count as I go through each of my weavings. And so this is another one I created. Um, uh, it's called Rivers and Reciprocity and just two different, um, uh, the inverse of one. This is another one that I created for, uh, it's like a flower type design. Just, I remember, I think I had two or three people in my life that was just kind of going through like these hard times and just trying to like design these things that just make people feel really good or like you're giving flowers to someone or um, giving a gift to someone. But I have a lot of digital files, so I won't go through all of them because they're just all over and I'm always like trying to practice new designs or like trying to figure something new out. But what I did come to terms with, with digital design is that I could easily turn them into screen prints. And so this is a screen print I did for a, a print exchange. Um, it's about the Blackberry winter, the winter that sets in here whenever it seems like it's all warm and then one more coldness will come in and it's called the Blackberry winter. And um, so this one, is one of the remnants from Olnigid. So thankfully I was able to keep all of those remnants, like all the papers that we didn't use or just cut offs or whatever, you know? And so I have I have quite a plenty of these um, prints. And so I made this for my mom for her birthday since this is her mom. And these are just, um, at the time this was a corn design, like a corn stock design that I had thought of and all the colors just reminiscent of corn. And these are the stars and people and then the weather patterns of just um, for gardening and, you know, understanding those those patterns in order to be a gardener, which she was. And my mom grew up with a garden and unfortunately we never did. And like, this is something like, I want her to like be able to start her garden again eventually. But she loved it. It was, it was really nice, nice to give her something that was so special to her with her mom. And this is the backside of the weaving, which unfortunately not a lot of times um, will be viewed. You know, when people frame the art, they don't get to see the backside of it. And I really like all of the backsides of them. They provide a whole different, whole different thing. Yeah, that that's that that's a nice addition to our uh, eternal discussion. We have we have several uh, sort of eternal questions on our uh, live stream and podcast. First, first is what's what's a book and what's not a book, and uh, mm -hmm. especially when you when you are uh, talking about artist books, uh, the definition of of a book book can be really really wide. And uh, and the, the other important question we discuss with many of our question, uh, guests is uh, uh, how to exhibit. Uh, book object or book related object because it's it's not two dimensional you cannot just put it on on a, on a shelf and uh, yeah. uh, you have to 
browse through the pages. You have to see the backside. Uh, when I go to a museum and I see yeah. some old bindings, I, I try to sort of look around uh, the, uh, the the book from all sides because I want to see the structural elements. Uh, I'm I'm as a, as a bookbinder, I'm more interested in technical aspects like how the end bonds yeah. were sewn or something like that. And oftentimes it's really mm -hmm. hard to you know to see because nobody knows how to exhibit books and uh, this is also an <laughs> illustration to 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 this issue yeah and uh, yeah, uh, some I'm of sure our really guests uh, uh, went uh, as far as making their own way of uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. displaying their objects, including Richard Minsky, who d designed a very complicated, elaborate, and uh, a very nice apparatus. And uh, Mark Cockrum also makes his uh, his Spence, glass box yeah. to yeah. some. Yes, so, so so perhaps if you want your uh, uh, your art to be seen from both sides, you should frame them in a way that no nobody could possibly display them otherwise. <laughs> like something <laughs> big, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, after I started uh, getting back into my work again, I was a, um, asked to do a show at a gallery called Echo Mano in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and. Um, I had a really good time making work for this show uh, as like my first, like, I guess my first show out of grad school, you know, and it felt really good to be able to experiment. And so this is a screen print with Black Tyvek and I still have like a really large roll of Black Tyvek from my, um, my large book uh, installation. And this is, um, handmade paper and this is another piece of paper that was a remnant of Olmigid and screen printed paper too and so you can see the back side as well like there's no color on the back side because it's not printed on the back side but this one was about um Otis's birth the last one was just about spending time with my partner and my my son um it's just so interesting like going for, I mean I didn't really think I would have children and uh, when I had Otis, like it just changed my whole perspective and gave me a lot of empathy and um, really helped me grow as a person and an artist. I, I feel like he really influenced a lot of my art making after he was born and from the time he was growing in my stomach. And this is a screen print. And this is a paper that I made um, with an artist. Her name is Georgia Deal. She, she offers workshop out of her house. And so I took a workshop with her and that's where I found out that the yellow paper is extremely hard to make. But this is a micaceous paper. Um, uh, what is that? It has mica in it. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's some shimmer in it, but um, I have some other sheets of this paper and I tried cutting some of the heavily mica micaceous uh, sheets and they're harder to cut of course because there's mica in them um, this one has very few little speckles of mica so um, these the pink paper is like a lot easier to cut and, but also what I found too is that weaving with um, handmade papers is extremely difficult they're more fragile and um, they move so differently than um, manufactured papers and this is called contraction. Um, this is just about my my labor pains. This one's at our uh, museum in Cherokee right now for um, a show called Disruption. And then my first time kind of like doing something more, sh um, not in the regular square or rectangle, but something outside of that form. And this one was really unique. Um, because I had a framer out in New Mexico who made a really great frame for it that did the whole outline of it. And I've been looking for another one and I can't find one. <laughs> uh, I've asked framers to do it and they just said they don't, they don't have the capacity to do it or they don't know how to do it. But hopefully um, I'll find someone else because unfortunately um, the framer in New Mexico, he doesn't do a lot of framing anymore. He's like kind of done. <laughs> And so he'll he'll do things for me sometimes, but I just don't like to bother him because he's probably just relaxing. Uh, and sorry, uh, screen and print with a screen print. 
And, and here the technique is uh, the same in terms of weaving, uh, but different in terms of cutting, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks three-dimensional. It looks like... It... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like I've done really good with We're looking shape. from the top and it's actually like yeah. mountain shape or something like that, yeah. <laughs> These are handmade paper with black Tyvek, and this was about the trimesters that I was um, going through. And this is a small video of the weaving with one of those. Yeah, I wish it moved this quick whenever I was like weaving in real time. <laughs> the real time is so slow. <laughs> Yeah, we, we well, uh, our viewers can go to uh, to Sky's Instagram and uh, see see the video of real time weaving, or they can go to our oh, Instagram yeah, yeah. because we also posted uh, just a couple of days ago uh, as an announcement a video where where you can see uh, the the light the, the real uh, real time <laughs> weaving process, which is yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's really slow. Yeah, um, and so this was made for a friend of mine. Um, and she uses a lot of these colors in her and um, the palette that they create. And so I wanted to use a lot of the colors that they like to use. So I did this um, rainbow roll. Oh, I thought it was there. I have it on another slide. Um, but just like the printing process that is involved in making these, because I have to make the print first and then cut down the print and weave it. This is one of my largest ones. This is um, 35 inches by 25 inches. And again, this is a color plan paper and um, screen printed paper. And, I, I, and I, sh I should I should comment that 35 inches is near one meter, just just below one meter or something <laughs> like that. So just just for <laughs> our metric <laughs> viewers to understand. <laughs> And and uh, this is a gallery piece, uh, uh, I, uh, I I assume, because I can only imagine it on a big white wall. Yeah, it has an orange frame. It's really nice. Um, right now, I think it's in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, at the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft. And so this is a letterpress print, The um, this black one. That's a letterpress print with ornaments. And then it's uh, woven with the screen print. This one was a really uh, great screen print to create because I got to go out to Los Angeles and print uh, self-help graphics with Dewey Tafoya, who is the master printer there in um, six colors that we printed. And so this is all digitally done first. And we, we had some um, issues printing, but it was really nice to learn his tricks because he's, he's very talented. Like he and strong like these um these prints were so large like his squeegee was i i think i pr i pulled one print and it was just so tough to pull because the squeegee was so big and this is handmade paper with a uh, handmade paper and dyed paper so the middle part is the dyed paper and this is the handmade paper from Olnigid and this paper comes from um kelsey pike uh kelsey pike is out of kansas city kansas and their paper is just so incredible too in the back side of that i'm gonna go a little quicker because i think we're really um almost out of time um <laughs> this is bloodroot patch and so this was this came out of um after harvesting like all the plant material for basketry here in Cherokee, this was um, kind of the story about just harvesting bloodroot. And that was in a solo show of mine up at um, Linfield University. This one is another uh, corn design of mine um, coming out of that last corn design that I talked about previously. And this is a screen print um, woven with um, a screen printed vellum. This is also at the Kentucky Muse Museum of Art and Craft. And this one doesn't have any um, printing techniques in it. This is just woven paper. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is a, a different rendition of the rivers and reciprocity design that I showed you on the, the digital work that I do. So I took that, I changed it up a little bit and this is color plan paper that's woven with um, a screen print. This one's really special because this one um, is for two of my cousins that I really looked up to when I was a kid, uh, Preston and Darren. Um, and this is kind of like their design because they were just the art people of our family. And I was able to just watch them as I was a kid and um, admire their work and not necessarily learn their techniques because like they're still like they're they're so good at what they do, but we also have different art practices, but this is for them. And then again, the, um, the corn design that's in this one, it just looks a little bit different because it's on uh, not an angle. Mm -hmm. And this is a handmade paper by Kelsey Pike again and uh, woven with the screen print. But this is um, how I do the screen printing. So creating all the gradients and then making the prints. And sometimes if they're not smooth enough, like I'll just reprint on top of them and till they, they have like the real gradient going. This is the vellum in the print from earlier. I wanted to use this paper for that weaving, but it wasn't long enough. So I just decided to make the color and then screen print the color and use that instead. And then some more, um, some more gradients on the right side. This is an example of um, some metal type ornaments that I use. Mm -hmm. So every time I go to different uh, residencies or print shops, then I'm able to look into their collection and make new designs and then use them for weaving later. So that's from um, a print shop called uh, In Cahoots in California. And that was something I made there too out of ornaments. And these are all ornament printed too. So I, I print at the studio, I bring them home and I cut them up and then I put them into new things. And this is um, some of my own metal type that I was able to uh, get for free because a shop was closing down. So they gave me a few, um, a few pieces of metal type this one and a spiral one too. These are just variations of that diamond. And this is the spiral um, metal type piece. Nice. And so I print the, um, the metal type on different colors and then cut down everything and then weave them together. And some more variations on that. They're all spirals. And then um, because I like to uh, make large books, I decided to make Onigid very large. And so I, <laughs> I made these um, really, really large weavings, which were so different to make than like the small, the small um, eighth of an inch that I usually create. And this is in the gallery space and I was able to um, get wood wood panels cut down and painted and put this together. <laughs> so then it's life size. And this is the photo we, uh, we put on the poster of, of our oh, yeah. interview because this is amazing. <laughs> it was such hard work. I, it took me like a day and a half to install this and Took a lot of double-sided tape. I didn't want to glue it down because um, this is going to be uh, another location opening up in April uh, at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts. It opens on April 14th and goes until August 12th. And so um, they'll have to re-put it together. <laughs> um, we had a lot of shipping kind of issues. Like It's so expensive to ship something this large. So um, everything had to be taken apart, rolled up, and the panels had to be shipped um, in a smaller container so that it wasn't as expensive. 
So this one you get to keep. <laughs> yes. I, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know where to keep it at. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with sculpture. Is like, where do you keep? You can't put it in a flat file. Not the same way you could put prints and weavings and stuff. It works on paper. And so this is my mom and Otis and me. And she helped us um, uh, gather uh, plant dye material and stuff for basketry. And so like I was saying before, um, I've never made a Cherokee basket um, out of white oak. So I made one in May of last year. Um, our tribe was doing, um, they had some type of grant where we could learn the whole process of like the harvesting and cutting down everything. And then we're working with master um basket weavers and people who know things in the community and so this is the first basket that I started making and that's the that's the final final image of it that's another one that I made with a handle this time and these are my two of my teachers uh on the left is Louise Goings and the right is uh Pat Welch but they, they were just there with me the whole time, like helping me with every single thing. Like they're so good at what they do. And then it goes into um, my process, my thoughts of like, well, I want to bring pottery and clay into the mix. So I made this little vessel and um, glued down these um, uh, letterpress prints on the sides of it and then wove it with the white oak and wove it with um, letter press prints as well. And this one was for um, our museum here for the new show that they put up last last uh, summer. And then I tried to make another one and it broke, but which is fine, you know, like all of it's just like a new process for me. So I'm trying to like fill it out and figure it all, like how it fits into fits into my story, how it fits into um, the work that I create. And thankfully this one was successful. And these letterpress prints, when I cut them down, were like the perfect size to wrap around this vessel. And this is the, the end product of it. So all of these are letterpress prints. Um, all of them print it with ornaments from in cahoots in Petaluma. And this is what I'm working on currently. And so on the left hand side, these are all um, ornamented ornaments that were letterpress printed and then cut very small and I'm making a new a new little weaving. And then this is another project that I'm also working on, another weaving which is um, screen printed, this whole page is screen printed, and then these are screen printed and then woven through them. But yeah, I'll, I'll end there. That's what I'm working on currently. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, we're sort of uh, ready for the future. <laughs> with, yeah, with, yeah. With your current work. Um, we have a couple of comments and uh, only only one question, uh, but uh, I, I would also ask uh, our viewers to stay with us we have, because we have our second guest uh, uh, waiting to join us. Uh, so please don't leave. Uh, uh, we'll discuss more interesting stuff a bit later. But uh, so what, what do we have uh, with, uh, with comments? Um, uh, Barbara, let me I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Sky, could you uh, go to the previous slide? Because, uh, yeah, this is visu uh, visually more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The black just, just not to have black screen. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, uh, Barbara Lemke, uh, Rohrer, uh, reverse and reciprocity um, equals so cool. <laughs> uh, then, uh, Daria Welch uh, Wilbur, absolutely gorgeous work. Um, uh, Amanda J. Al, Al Selman, uh, um, the, the gradation of color is beautiful. Uh, these comments 
came uh, while we were you were talking about some pre some previous projects but well i i guess they work for almost everything um then uh, uh, minkas uh this makes uh, beautiful book covers um uh, i i i guess it's all about the, the woven uh sheets and objects uh santi fraser um uh, thanks for a terrific talk uh, i enjoy hearing artists geek out on their process. Uh, that's absolutely true as well. And uh, Dave uh, Turnbull got to admit that this talk has left me feeling a bit confused, but in a good way. Sky has opened up so many new ideas for me that I just have no idea where to even start. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> <yeah>. Cool. <laughs> good confused. That's cool. And then a question yeah. from uh, Barbara Barbara Lemkarorer. Do you wear gloves while while weaving metal? No, I didn't, and it resulted in a lot of cuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think my dad did though, because my dad's a little more much more wise than i am <laughs> um yeah it's hard well it comes with experience I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay and, uh, uh, one small uh, one one small question for uh for me uh, uh are you hoping uh to pass on your uh, your weaving skills uh have you started uh, uh, teaching it no, I don't like to teach. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I'm i just not comfortable in a classroom. I've done some teaching things and I just, I feel really awkward. It's, I guess it just all comes with experience too. Like I haven't done enough teaching things, but um, I think I'd be okay teaching in my community, but I don't really want to teach an institution or. Then, uh, that's, I uh, that's what yeah. I wanted uh, to ask. And what about in family setting? Are you going to teach a kid? Surely you're gonna teach your kid. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I hope that he's interested. Yeah, I also wanted to ask maybe if it's 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 more of something like an an apprentice setting, not not a classroom, but uh, one on one or just just a couple of uh, uh, students or followers of 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 the craft. So maybe it will it will yeah, feel, feel differently. I do I do like that a lot a lot better and. What I will say too is that I always like hope that I can help someone, especially even in like um, like fin not financial ways, um, like how to take care of your finances because I've learned a lot through all of these these things that I do. Is that like I have to make sure that my finances are up and up, and then also think about contracts and how to work with institutions and how to work with people um i've learned a lot within a short amount of time and i've always like open to share those with people because it was something that i didn't know how to do when i entered like the art art realm and the art field um stuff that people don't talk about like the the taxes and like all these other things you know it's like it it is like a job and you it it's really scary it's daunting but it has to be done and so I always offer that to people. It's like if I can help you in some kind of way to like pass on some sort of knowledge that I have within uh, figuring out the tax kind of things and how to make contracts and things like that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and for uh, telling about your projects. It's absolutely amazing. And we're so happy to, to have you here on our live stream. Uh, and we hope to maybe return to you in the future, maybe in a couple of years to talk about uh, new projects. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate your time and for asking me and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for listening and uh, being interested in what I do. Yeah. It means a lot to me. And a lot of, a lot of great comments. To thank, thank, thanks to everyone for, for that. Uh, Tanuki Mischief. Thank you so much for uh, sharing story today. Well, um, I, I, I absolutely agree. So uh, uh, that's it. that's it with Sky for today. Uh, we will be joined uh, with uh, uh, Leah in in a moment. Uh, we will ask Sky to leave uh, our Zoom call at the moment, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and we'll continue in, in just a okay. bit. Th thanks again, and uh, talk, All right. talk later. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. You. <laughs> later. Bye. Yeah, bye. You too. So... Uh, do you have to switch?
teams in the streaming software uh, because there are just two of us for the yeah. moment. Uh, I, I, have, I have already done that. <laughs> yeah. <Goodness>. So uh, <laughs> just just a moment. Uh, please don't leave. I mean, I mean, so to all of our viewers, <laughs> please stay with us. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, going uh, anywhere. Yeah. So Leah Le is gonna uh, join us now. Leah right? will join us in a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I sent a message. So. It should be, we should be not, not alone soon. Um, so, yeah, Here's Leo. Now, now there are three of us, almost, mm -hmm. almost there. Yeah. <laughs> now we need to get some audio and video. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So, um. uh, yeah, so 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 sorry for this uh, a bit of delay, but I I, I hope you 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 had an interesting time. Uh, well, not interesting time, but well, it was an interesting thing to watch. Um, yes, yes, I was on the on YouTube and saw all this before, and it was really interesting and amazing work. So, yeah, it's really wow <laughs> to see all this work. So um, here is uh, uh, Lea Gisake. I, am I am I pronouncing the the surname right? Uh, I hope. <laughs> yeah, and you join us from from Germany. Are you are you in Berlin or in the area somewhere yes. there? I'm in Berlin. Yeah. Now, yes. And uh, you've been working on this sort of cheat sheet for uh, bookmakers, uh, poster cards thing, and uh, we wanted to discuss it discuss it uh, tonight. And uh, also, you have a crowdfunding running right now like until something like second of uh, april so for for a couple more days so if uh, our viewers will check the link in the description there is there is a link to this kind of crowdfunding and the link to 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 the project page so but we'll we'll let you talk yeah and i can uh, share my build uh, my yeah my yeah screen isn't yeah. it yeah sure you should be able to do that yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes, I think now you should see the presentation. But, so unfortunately, it's not full screen. Most of what we can see are menus on the right and on the top maybe you could make it a bit bigger if you can if if not it's okay uh, it's okay okay <laughs> so i i put it on my uh, laptop it was on the full screen so maybe just uh i don't know or just take it like this yeah. is better yeah this is better <laughs> bigger yeah. Great. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That should work. <laughs> cool. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for the inv invitation. So yeah, I want to talk about the book binding kit. Um, and before I can say, yeah, I'm a graphic designer from Berlin, and I'm really interested in book design. And yeah, I studied communication design and while studying, I were really interested in books. So I were specialized in this. And last year I did my master thesis. I finished this in April. And there I were interested in the relationship of digital and analog books. And in the theoretical part, so you, you have a practical and a theoretical part. Um, uh, so in the theoretical part, I was writing a lot and searching a lot about the difference between digital and analog book media and also about the haptic experience of books. And in the practical part, I will develop the book binding kit. And so now I want to talk a bit about the book binding kit and how I came to this idea. Yeah. So when I studied in the master, um, I worked at the 
at, at the book bindery in the university. Um, so as an assistant and there students come and want to bind their project. So most of them have like an, an basic course where they learn the basic techniques of paper and cutting and uh, the basic bookbinding techniques. But when they make their own project, they have a lot of questions and they need support to bind them. And when they, m most of them just make one or two book projects and not doing all the time book projects. So um, they have not, no idea what they want to do. So they come and have a lot of questions and then you go there and take uh, all bookshelves, a lot of books and show them different techniques. And most <laughs> of them, they are really confused of <laughs> everything. <laughs> And I guess I, and I then... guess I guess oftentimes the questions are pretty similar from from one student to another. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are quite similar. And uh, a lot of people ask whether there is an overview of all the techniques because they can't remember it when you tell them once. Yeah. And so, for me in my math thesis, it was clear: you need an overview. So there is no overview. Um, so I need to do it. And so I started looking in different book binding books, how they're, uh, so yeah, the most of them are in German because I yeah. <laughs> uh, studied in German. Um, and but some yeah, of them uh, quite the, new, by the way. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I looked how there uh, the book binding is presented and how there are different categories. And um, I, I, I was seen that most of them are quite um, quite simple in um, shared in in hardcover and soft cover so they are not like experimental and combining different techniques so uh, they are most like the cr classic uh, okay there are two different categories of book there are the hardcover and the soft cover and hardcover are most of them are three stitching and soft cover are perfect binding and so but in the in the reality, it's not like this. There are not this clear categories of yeah, books are like this or like this. So every every book has its own de details. There are rhythm bookmarks and dust jackets and more more details like screen printing and other uh, small little details. And so I thought I, I want to show it all. So it's not like the main techniques. Uh, I, I want to have the whole overview so that you can combine all them together and get a no new idea of what books could do and experiment with all the books. And so I, I thought about four categories. Um, I, I said, okay, I, I need this kind of system. And uh, I took the categories uh, binding, cover, folding, and add-ons. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I start to collect and collect and collect. And um, yeah, now you see here the the bindings and the the covers, foldings, and um, the add-ons. So there are also a lot of add-ons. <laughs> And then I said, okay, yeah, you have the freedom to combine them all as you want. There's not a special system, just take what you want and combine them. And then uh, the most professors say, you're crazy, you can't do this. That's not possible, that doesn't work. <laughs> but I really like this idea. So I start uh, to make a workshop. So I ask students, in the in the project week, so there we have more freedom to try something out. I uh, ask students uh, to take of each category one card, and then make so randomly, so they can't choose. It's just they they got it, and so they from this card they they choose or or they took randomly. They need to develop a book object. And so great. I first gamification. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. And so like 21st century, this is this is I, I love it. And then it's 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 a great tool for creativity when when uh, well yes. often oftentimes you have to make the decision 
to start something and it's it's a it's a it's a hard moment to to begin the project and to understand what you want to do here you can you can uh, uh, shift this responsibility on the on fatum and <laughs> on yes, the fate yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, it actually reminds me there is this uh well-known uh, uh youtube maker uh, uh simon gish i think yeah. it's pronounced simon, and simon she, uh, yes, she, simon yes yes she made the dice with a german with a german maker uh whose name is uh, i'm blanking right now i'm following her on 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 youtube as well and yeah and they they made three yeah, guys and they, and they had these dice to develop make a project so make mm -hmm. out of what uh related to what and make it say like big or small or so uh, the uh, the, uh, this uh, gamification of making uh, of making is very much uh, uh, now so great yeah. idea yes. so, this, this super contemporary <laughs> yes, this was the idea. And so the students started to make to to learn these techniques and to look what they could do. So they made uh, small models and just first uh, trying to figure out how how like a choreography of a book could work. And I also give some restrictions of the materials and uh, the color. So I don't want that they just take everything. So I just, I thought, okay, it's better to have like black and white and just um, from the format also not make something really big so that they have a better overview and a bet better context of, um, so that they have not so many possibilities and uh so yeah then um i tried it out and the the students had really big fun of doing it and then yeah you see these are the books they they're developed in one week and yeah they are without text they're without um uh, images they are just about the 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 paper the material and the haptics and um, the, the the form or the chore chore choreography of of paper, and yeah, I show you some examples uh, of the book, and there you see the big diversity of how you can use paper and how different books could like, and how you can imagine uh, to to think out of the box uh, w when you think about books, and. Yes, there were a lot of different ideas and really every every student have their own idea and their own creativity and even simil similar cards were developed really completely different because the combination of these techniques yeah, make it every book uh, unique. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so the, the book binding workshop was a really real success. <laughs> so I was empowered to 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 just uh, yeah take this uh, concept, and I send it to different people to get feedback. And uh, one of the uh, the persons who gave me feedback was Christina from the publishing house Prima Publication. It's a small publishing house in Stuttgart. They are really specialized on small editions and really nice designed books, also with a focus on the materials and on, on, on how a book feels like, so that it's really an object that you really like to have in the hand and that you really, yeah, that there's a lot of energy and a lot of heart in all the, the book objects they are producing. And so they have seen the, the project and they said, well, that's a cool project. We want to publish it in our small publishing house. And so when I finished my master, I get in contact with them and I, yeah, and we developed it to, um, yeah, to, to publish it. And now, um, yeah, you know, and, and then uh, it was, and when in my math thesis, it was just a poster, so you can hang it on the wall. And then there came the, the publishing house and they have 
different ideas so it need to be more practical um to 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 send it to other people and so there came the idea of um, making a folding poster so it's not just a, a poster it's more than an object and i really really liked the idea because uh, so the poster gets more like an object so it's re really good related to the to the content of the of this poster and so um yeah i need to develop it a bit more and now it's like it it's this poster this folding where you have this categories so so every category you can um open and see it and um put it together to through this um object so yeah here you have also this um this illustrations and how you, here you see how it fo folds folded and another picture yeah and then also the uh the publishing house was really interested in in the in the cards because they also really liked the idea of the workshops and uh also they are really creative people and they like this uh yeah this idea of combining and just looking what what came up when you try something new and so uh, the idea is that we also want to publish these cards of the book binding kit so that as on every every um every every card is one technique and on the one side is just the the illustration and the name and on the back side you have more detailed information of the the pros and cons of the different techniques and for because it's more expensive to to produce it um we started a crowdfunding campaign on start next yeah i so i posted this... the link in in the in the comment section both on my facebook Perfect. and youtube so <laughs> everybody can click right now <laughs> yes it's, it's re so you see it's like 85 percent, maybe something more now but yeah it's really uh yeah it, it's the, the last four days of this crowdfunding and there's still money left so it's really really cool if you could support this do you project. do you do you have to absolutely meet the target or you still will be funded uh, even even if you don't meet the target because on different crowdfunding platforms it's it works differently no i need to i need to get the target okay so <laughs> we need we need to offer some help to, yes, to Leah. yes yes <laughs> yeah. yes please please <laughs> and uh yeah but it, it's all in german so it's maybe not so easy to understand, but it's not so difficult. So just unterstützen, it means support. So yeah. <laughs> I, and, I think and, uh, and, you and know all, a bit about all, all modern browsers uh, can can translate uh, German into yes. English pretty well. I had a, a question okay. about this crowdfunding because I see mm -hmm. that you can you can um, choose either a poster or or the cards, but yes. if I want to have both of them. What should I do? You can select both. So you can just say, add another thing, and then you can add another thing. OK, OK. That's what <laughs> I'll do. <then. laughs> you can add another thing and another thing and another thing. You can yeah. take yeah. all if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I like I like the idea of license, but I, I, I'm not at that place yet. <laughs> uh -huh. But maybe, maybe 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 we should discuss it uh, when when the live stream ends or or in a couple of days uh, and uh, especially yes. when when I'm settled with a new workshop and understand my finances a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is also the end of my presentation. So now here is also some some links and the the picture of this poster. So yeah, if you have any questions or ideas or whatever comes to your mind, um, yeah, just ask and and tell. Uh, so we have a question from from one of our viewers uh, from Barbara Lemke Uh Is is uh, the master thesis printed in German only? In German and in English, it's printed. Okay, so it, are the cards? 
the cards? No, no, the, the cards. Thesis. Your your thesis. No, your your thesis. Ah, uh, my thesis. It's in German, yes. <laughs> so some people are interested in the theoretical part. Yeah. Yes, it's in in uh, it's in um in German, uh, but I can send it as a PDF, yeah. and. There are some really good translators. Yeah, Maybe again, again. I can just yeah. put the PDF into a translator and yeah. they will. Yeah, they, they yeah, started so to work really well uh, as, as a yeah, play. I day. wrote it in German. Yes. Yeah. So then, uh, Amanda J. Al Selman, uh, are you planning an English language launch? I understand that the poster is, is available in English, so you can choose. On the yes. on the yes. uh, crowdfunding page, you can choose either a German poster or a uh, English poster. Or but 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 for the cards, are the cards available in English or, or they are only available in in German? Um. So the first edition, it's will it will be in in German. Yeah. And after it, we will think whether we do it in English too. We have a really good translator, so yeah. Xenia Leipzinger, I don't know, maybe you know them. She's also a, a bookbinder. And uh, yeah, she really, she translated the, the, the German uh, poster into the English poster. And um, yeah, we will see uh, whether we can uh, translate the cards too, but it needs a bit more time. Yeah. Uh, so first the the cards in German, and after it, I think when there's a big interest, then uh, yeah, we will make the cards in English too. Yeah. Yeah, and trans uh, translation in bookbinding is never an e an easy thing. There are so many techniques that you can't uh, exactly translate, or you have to really dig through the literature to find uh, the exact name <laughs> of it. And sometimes the, it seems that just just there is no uh, no relevant term existing in a different language because I I, I visited a uh, Vivern Bindery here in London uh, last week and uh, I saw that one of the jobs they do or uh, apparently is uh, um, sewing together uh, issues of magazines and and newspapers and in in the Russian tradition there is a specific word for this type of work mm -hmm. uh, or for this mm -hmm. type of uh, bound uh, uh, magazine print run and it's called uh, mm -hmm. con convolut and i think it's it's coming from french or something like that uh but uh and and i asked them well is there any any, any specific term for that in english tradition and they were like a gathering of journals so uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in German, it would probably one long word consisting of those exact words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So even even in Germany, there are different regions and different book binderies have their own names. So all the book binding is not as clear as some other uh, other uh, parts <laughs> of uh, yes, some other. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's really the the idea of uh, every book bindery has their own techniques and their own names. And in the north of Germany, it's like this, and in the south of Germany, another name. So I I can think, okay, yeah, in Europe, in different <laughs> countries, also different names. But I'm, I'm really interested to stay in contact with all the different uh, communities uh, in the different countries and to learn from them because I think it's it's good for everybody if we stay in context and learn from each other and don't think yeah we have our technique and it's like this and you can't change it yeah yeah well uh thank you and i i'm so glad that we decided to invite you uh today and uh even if it was a bit later than we planned uh but but anyway uh it, it was interesting to to see the uh, project. Well, I, I saw some photos on your Instagram uh, before, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, when, when you are talking about it, and especially with this experience about uh, working with students and uh, uh, this creativity tool, uh, I, 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 I sort of, as, as, as we mentioned, as both Pavel and I mentioned, we uh, understood the idea right away, but uh, when I was uh, uh, browsing before, I, I didn't get it. So uh i i am so glad that we, we we had a chance to talk to you here and uh, uh that you showed all of it all of it to us today yeah thank you thank so, you also it's really nice to to see you here and to present it 
everybody who is honor. still watching or who, who will be watching this uh, video before the 2nd of April or including the 2nd of April, I guess, uh, please uh, uh, go to the startnext.com uh, link and uh, uh, support uh, Alias projects. And uh, there is uh, a, a bit of a bit more money uh, has, to, has to go to it, into this project for, for it to be funded. <laughs> so please, please help, help Leah uh, 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 fund it. Um, yeah. And I'll go and do it right now after after we start stop streaming. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I guess that's it. If if uh, there are any questions still from our viewers, please post them. Uh, well, we we had we had at least one question about the, the thesis, but uh, yeah, also about about the English language. So uh, we already had some questions. Uh, but if you if you have anything add, uh, else to add, uh, please uh, post it and. Uh, uh, Dave Turnbull, this is an amazing project. Well, I absolutely agree. And uh, uh, Daria Welch uh, Wilbur, I'm pledging right now. So, yes. congrats. <laughs> yes, nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, um, good luck. And uh, I will definitely send you a message and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about it later. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, that's that's it for today. Uh, such an amazing uh, live stream. I think it's uh, one of the best live streams <laughs> we had in, 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 in the past few months. And uh, um, uh, well, uh, we'll see how it goes <laughs> after that. Uh, we'll stay for for a minute longer, probably, uh, because well, it's it's how usually stream goes. We need to wait until the uh, video, uh, the streamed video ends, and uh, then that's it. Uh, so. Uh, I'll, I'll do my technical stuff. Pavel will talk uh, for a bit. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everybody, for, for uh, thanks being ev with us. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for, uh, for, uh, for staying with us. Uh, it was Dave, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Turnbull, uh, nice. Yeah. Dave Turnbull commented that, that he's trying to uh, pledge for the uh, poster. So another one. Another one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was a really, uh, a really li uh, a lively stream. So many questions, so many interactions with.